grateful to be back with you. I'm so grateful to see so many of you came back after that first session. Um, because let's be honest, this is stretching our imagination a little bit for some of us and how to be the church and how to reach new people and to really take uh, into consideration how the world's kind of changed around us and how we can share the gospel faithfully in that. Um, so as soon as uh, the PowerPoint comes up at some point, I'll, be, I'll get started here. And I want to share about um, contextual intelligence, which if we're going to kind of do these things that I've been, I've been sharing about today, um, it's really the most important competency um, for the church today. It's kind of the ancient secret to mission on the front lines. Uh, and so I'll, I'll go through this and then welcome any kind of questions that you might have as we go along. But we kind of saw in uh, COVID-19 the first kind of global black swan event, right? And we saw this really um, encourage churches. Some of us been speaking and talking and writing about you know, how to uh, engage people online and, you know, stream worship services and do those kind of things um, for, for decades. Um, but COVID kind of thrust us into a space where we had to do that uh, to, like, survive. Can I get an amen from anybody? Um, and so we had to try to figure that out as we went along. To try, try to get a, um, like, a kind of a, a snapshot, if you will, of the level of change that's taking place. Let's look at this picture here. This is 2005. This is the Pope getting ready to come out and give the inaugural address. Uh, and these people have gathered to see the Pope. Um, can you count how many phones you see uh, in the crowd there? Just shout out a number if you see one, two, th three. Somebody's got some good ideas. That's Mike there with his flip phone in the front. Uh, he's still got that flip phone. No, just kidding. Flip phones are making a comeback, by the way. So say it. So we have, what, two, three, somebody with good eyes said three. Okay, so we're going to jump forward now to 2013. How, how many can you count now? Yeah, a lot, right? Pretty much everybody. So this, this is the same event. People gathered to come see the Pope, that inaugural address. And um, can you see the proliferation of d digital devices and connectivity? Um, that's happening there and how that really does change the way people work, fall in love, get jobs, uh, connect in community, uh, do life together, right? That's a significant change that we have to uh, take into account. Now, I spoke earlier about the kind of the decline in the uh, normal attendance of church folks. That decline in affiliation, really part of it is a, a push against membership. It's a membership averse culture. And for our churches, we're really built on a membership model, right? So people come and, and we do the class and we learn the kind of basics of the belief. Then we join something, we're like lifelong members. We come down to the altar, we say the thing, and we're in, right? Well, people are really pushing against that idea of a lifelong membership of institutions. But they'll participate in groups and organizations and churches that are uh, creating change and purpose and meaning in people's lives. But this idea people are just going to sign up and become a lifelong member, that's something we have to kind of re, re, readapt and, and think about that. And then there's this, as I spoke earlier about the rise in spirituality, spiritual but not religious, people open to different spiritual practices and paths uh, in Jesus in a profound way, but pushing against the church a little bit as, as part of that identity. Um, so how do we kind of read our context? How do, we, how do we see where God has been working um, in our past and, and what God might be doing in our present? And then maybe even a little bit about what God's doing in the future. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about this mysterious tribe called the Issacharians. Um, and did you know that God gave a gift set to the church, a futurist gift set? Now, this is a little bit different than the prophetic gift set. So perhaps you're familiar with Ephesians 4 and the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher, that five-fold thing. And so prophets really hold people to fidelity to God's truth. And sometimes that's about making predictions, not all the time. Uh, that's really more about how do, how do we proclaim God's word and hold people to the truth of God's word. Amen? But there's this, this other kind of gift set, this futurist gift set, where, where God gives us a way to kind of understand what's coming. Right, And so futurist uh, uh, in the church is not about making predictions. 
Um, I'm just going to use a really bad metaphor here, and excuse me uh, for, for the crudeness of this. But trying to predict the future is a lot like trying to hock a loogie in a windstorm. There's a good possibility it's going to come back into your face, right? Um, but did you know that God gives us an actual vision of what is going to happen in the future? We already know it, right? We as churches, we can, we can spend a lot of time creating vision statements and all that. Anybody spend years of your life creating vision statements in the church? Um, and actually, God's given us one that's more beautiful and profound and powerful than anything we could come up with in a boardroom. Uh, and it starts to unfold throughout the New Testament. And really, uh, in the book of Revelation, what we see there is um, every tribe and nation and people gathered together around the Lamb of God. We see that we're back in the garden, the new creation. We're back at the tree of life. Remember that tree we lost access to in the beginning of our story? Well, now we're back, but it's an urban garden. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Uh, and we gather at the river of life. And uh, God himself will wipe away all of our tears. Uh, and there's abundance and there's healing and there's new creation. God's given us a pretty awesome future uh, to look forward to. Can I get an amen? Uh, and in Hebrews, we actually learned that Jesus actually is our anchor of hope. Um, that that he's, got, he's pierced the veil, it says. He's gone beyond the veil and he's, he's thrown us this anchor of hope from the future that we hold on to. Now, when you think about an anchor... That's something we typically think about, like it keeps us in the same spot, right? Um, in the ancient world, and still today, there's a, a sailor tactic called kedging. Anybody familiar with this? Kedging, okay. Um, there's there's got to be some lakes and rivers and stuff around here somewhere, right, where we do. Okay, maybe this is more for a coastal kind of metaphor here. Maybe I'm, this is a failure of contextual intelligence in this moment right here. Um, but kedging is you, you, a little boat, rowboat, would go out in front of a big ship when you're stuck in inclement weather and there's no wind, and the little rowboat would go forward, drop anchor, and then pull the big ship forward. Pull the big ship forward to where the little boat, then you go out and you do it again. That's called kedging, so you're moving the boat forward using an anchor to do that. Well, for the church, my friends, we are always kedging our way toward the future. Jesus has, he's given us a, a hope in the future, He's our anchor. We just got to hold on to the rope of hope that he's thrown from the future and like pull ourselves to that, right? And so what if futurist thinking for Christians is less about trying to predict the future and it's more about future fitting our communities and our congregations for the life of heaven now uh, and saying, what if our church, our community, what, it, what would it look like if Jesus was king around here? What if we started to try to create a, an environment where actually um, people of all tribes and races and cultures are gathered together around the throne of God and we're worshiping God together and there's healing and, and all of that. What if, what if we put our energy into trying to make that future God's already shown us our reality now? Are y'all with me so far? Can I get an amen? Well, well, this futurist kind of thing, this goes back to this little mysterious tribe called Issachar. And um, uh, Jesus gave us this, this, great, this great saying this is the message version of it, of course, but you have that saying, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky at morning, sailors take warning. You find it easy enough to forecast the weather, why can't you read the signs of the times? Now Jesus is calling us as Christians, as a church, and saying, look, if you, you can see the changes, the weather patterns, you know something's coming, and you can make a prediction about that and know what to do, right? How comes you can't read the greater work of God and what's happening and, and make accurate um, kind of decisions based off that, right? So Jesus is teaching us to have contextual intelligence. Um, so how do we really grow in our ability? If we're gonna engage our communities for Christ, we have to have contextual intelligence. We have to understand our context, where it is, where it's come from, and where it's going. And so I wanna give maybe hopefully some practical tools around this. Contextual intelligence is simply the ability to read the signs of the times and know what to do, to kind of read between the lines and make accurate decisions based on that. Uh, Alan Hirsch talks about contextual intelligence as finding the thread of God's meaning in the world and kind of pulling those that together now. Um, there's a, uh, two Harvard guys, Mayo and Nahira, they did this exhaustive um, research study and they looked at all the business legends um, across the last century. 
And so they looked at, at this diverse, uh, what they called the canon of business legends. So Madam C.J. Walker, the first female black millionaire. Uh, they looked at you know people like Walt Disney and Steve Jobs and people just uh, across that. And uh, all of them were different. They brought different leadership skills and abilities and personalities to the task of leadership. But the one thing that they all had in common, they identified, was contextual intelligence or the ability to kind of make sense of their times. And where other people were failing uh, and trying stuff, they were able to take those same kind of changes and harness that for positive um, results. So that was the kind of unifying thing about all those people. They could read what was happening and they could turn problems into opportunities and adapt um, in, in the moment. So um, I'm, I'm talking about leadership here as energizing a community of people towards some shared purpose, not leadership in the sense of the heroic solo leader comes up to the front and pulls the organization forward on their, on their own strength, right? But we together as a community discerning the spirit are moving towards some shared hope, future goal that God has given us and contextual intelligence assists us in that way. Um, and how those things are related, like our first task as people who follow Jesus, um, and I think we make too much about leadership in the church. Jesus says nothing about leadership. He says a lot about followership. Can I get an amen? And if we're good followers, then we actually end up becoming leaders in a sense as we lead, as, as moral people, as people who try to embody the life of Jesus in the world. We end up in a place where people may be kind of following us along as we're doing that. But Jesus doesn't say anything about making leaders and the divine CEO and all these things we've imported into the church. I know you don't want to say amen, but he taught us a lot about followership. Um, and so, but part of that is how do we like put a pin in the map and try to help people understand this is where we are. Maybe this is where God's calling us and this is where we've come from. Um, so here's the text, these, these Issacharians in uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32. All the different tribes are coming to King David at this time. So it's a time of liminality and change. And there's a transition of leadership from Saul to David. And so the different tribes are coming. And some of the tribes are bringing people power and weaponry and uh, resources and those things. The tribe of Issachar shows up empty-handed, but they bring a distinct kind of intelligence. And it's said of the tribe of Issachar that they were the ones who could read the signs of the times and knew what to do. They could read the signs of the times. Can y'all say that with me? Read the signs of the times and know what to do. So they show up and they're like, hey, we think this is what's happening. Let's uh, follow what God's doing here. Um, and there's a lot of scholarship, uh, rabbinic scholarship in particular about the Issacharians. Um, and they're, they're known for really insightful study of Torah. So there's these metaphors around them uh, living under the tent, dwelling under the tent, studying scripture. And they're paired up with their, their brother tribe, Zebulun, uh, and they work together in a shared leadership way and like resource each other. So when you think about biblical brothers throughout the Bible, it's not a good track record. Amen? It's like, uh, do you remember the first two brothers, how that goes? Cain and Abel, remember that? Doesn't go so well for Abel. Uh, then you think about Jacob and Esau and how that kind of goes, and then brother after brother. Kinda, then you get to the disciples, right, James and John, and they're like fighting over who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Not a good track record there. But Issachar and Zebulun are two brothers who are known to actually work together, resource each other. It's like one of the few stories in the Bible where two brothers actually come together and do that, right? It's amazing. And so Zebulun as a tribe is known for the, the, their resourcing, their entrepreneurial, their fishing folk, and they resource the Issacharians and they work together in this way. Um, so contextual intelligence has these two major uh, uh, pieces of it. So one of it is kind of reading the signs, knowing what to do. Or another way to think about that is evaluation, uh, what, what's happening, and then implementation based on what's actually happening, not what we think is happening then we, we move and we behave in response to that. Um, within that evaluation, there's really two, I'm gonna go all seminary professor, nerdy, high fluting words here, so stay with me for just a minute. But hermeneutics are a way to study scripture 
or like an interpretive framework for how we read the Bible. Um, that's when we're, we're, in, we're reading the Bible, we're using a hermeneutic. I was talking earlier about those Jesus stories, right? That's a hermeneutic. We're reading the whole Bible through Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. But then the part that we don't do in the church so well, now I know there's some Bible scholars in this room. I could, I could yell out some verses and you'd be able to like quote and do all that, right? Are there any Bible scholars in the room? Anybody read your Bible in the room? Please say amen. Raise your hand. Um, but semiotics, this this other thing that's, that's really important as well. And that's how we read the signs and meaning systems of culture, right? So I can know all about the Bible and Jesus, but if I can't communicate it in a language, in a way that the people in my community and the world today can understand it, I'm speaking in Christianese, nobody's picking up what I'm putting down. Can I get an amen? Uh, and when I'm talking a whole lot about what we're against, you know, Mike and I were talking about this over lunch, and rather what we're for as Christians, and how do I communicate the gospel, the good news, not just the way that it's good, but it's news for people. Like, I don't know about you, but uh, many of us preach to the same folks every Sunday. We're preaching the gospel every Sunday. I'm like, at what point are y'all going to get it? No, just kidding. Um, but how do we share the gospel for people that it's, it's good in a way that it's good and it's news for the people that have never heard it before, right? So to do that kind of work, we got to have that semiotic skill. And semiotics is the, the meaning systems, the signs and symbols that people use to communicate, the cultural uh, kind of mediums that people are using. Um, and bringing those two things together right in the middle there, that's the contextual intelligence sweet spot. So to know God's story, to know scripture, to bend our life to the truth of scripture, to understand that we're part of a story that's God's story, that we're in that story moving toward God's conclusion that he's revealed to us, but also uh, then studying how we communicate that to people outside the church. That would be a, a really important part of contextual intelligence. So every community that we serve uh, is like a tell. Are y'all familiar with this, this word tell? It's an Aramaic word when you go in like an archeological dig site and there's like layers of culture that you dig into and you can understand these people and where they come from and what they did. Every single context is like a tell of story and history and narratives that are happening there. Some of those layers are soaked in blood. Like there's some hard things that we as Christians need to reconcile in, in, in some of our contexts. There's some, some story there that we have to ex excavate uh, and, and deal with, right? Um, but s contextual intelligence gives us like a spade or a way to dig into our context and to understand it. And what often happens in the church world is we think we understand our context, especially if our church has been in the same place since the 1800s. We go, of course we know what's going on around here. We're the only permanent stakeholders here. We've been here for 200 years, right? We know what's going on. Actually, contexts are more like clouds than clocks. So they're changing all the time and not necessarily in a linear kind of mechanical way but just if you think about when you under you understand a cloud system right and you got a picture of what the sky looks like atmospheric conditions change right and the clouds change and contexts are like that they're always shifting and changing all around of it uh, so if we think we know what this community was like 50 years ago and we're basing our activity off what we thought we knew then that's not really contextually intelligent behavior, right? Because contextual intelligence requires a, us to constantly be sensing and having soft eyes what's happening in our community today, right now, in 2022. Can I get an amen? Um, so uh, this is a great quote from George Washington Carver uh, who talks about anything will give up its secrets if you love it long enough, if you spend enough time with it. Uh, and he knew about that, right? Because he found 300 and something uses for the peanut, right? He spent a lot of time with peanuts and, and figured out all these different ways that, that a peanut could do all kind of different things and could be used in different ways. And what if we saw our communities in our context like that? That really loving our community, listening to our community, spending that time, like digging through the tells, understanding the layers of story that are formative for this community. Um, and there, there's some, some work that has to be done there. 
Jesus says again, take a lesson from the fig tree. You know, you see the changing signs of the times, you know, and, and you can tell what to do based off that. So he's saying, come on, church, you got to have some contextual intelligence. Try to understand what's happening around you. And he was a master semiotician, right? He's walking around teaching through the medium, the culture, the people, talking about the kingdom of God is like seeds, right? Because what did the people know in that culture? Seeds, sowers. Uh, kneading a, a yeast into a, a bread loaf. So he wasn't walking around uh, as a seminary trained professor using language that, that nobody could understand. Wait a minute. Is that me right now in this moment? Um, but he wasn't doing that, right? He was, he was like going out talking about in stories and narratives that people could understand and, and, and sharing the gospel in that way. Uh, he taught the disciples to do the same thing. Some of his favorite words were look, observe, pay attention, you see, like look at the birds of the air, check out what they're doing, they're not punching a time clock, your father's feeding them, you see the lilies of the field, they're not laboring or toiling or spinning, and yet your, your father's taking care of them. Uh, he's teaching his disciples, pay attention to your surroundings, watch what's happening, look and listen and pay attention. And what if that is actually an act of intentionally engaging our communities for Christ? What if that's the whole thing needs to be undergirded by that prayerful, intentional listening and observing our communities with soft eyes? Um, and a gospel that is not contextualized is not faithful to the gospel, right? Because the gospel itself, in the words of Leslie Newbegin, is the, the word become flesh. So think about the gospel takes on now I'm talking about Jesus, the person. He's the good news, right? He, he's the good news, his person, uh, uh, his life, death, resurrection, and new creation, and is coming soon to bring that new creation. That's the good news. Can I get an amen? So the gospel itself is God putting on flesh and contextualization, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, not Jesus of the universe or Jesus of you know, somewhere, or Jesus of Jerusalem, or Jesus of Rome, Jesus of Nazareth, a particular place with particular people. So the gospel itself is a contextualization. And th the way we inherit it, and the way we read it, and, th and the way we understand it, we too are reading that through a lens of our own context. Um, and a church that's not a contextualized expression of its community is not faithful to the gospel. So think about this. We've been able for a long time to do like a franchise version of the church like the McDonaldized version of the church, where we can go to any corner and we plant a church and it looks the same and it has the same liturgy and we do the same things, right? It's like a, a standardized version of church. The pews are arranged the same way, the pulpit's usually in the same spot, and we do church kind of similarly in those different contexts. Like you can plant any church, it looks like this anywhere in the world. Well, we're not getting away with that anymore, friends. Uh, this, this requires us to actually go out and create culturally and contextually appropriate forms of church that speak the language of the people, that happen in their rhythms and their times in a way that they can connect with it and sharing the gospel in words and language that they can actually comprehend and join into in a way that brings meaning and purpose to their life. And we can break that down like into two big kind of categories, if you will. But the gospel has a somewhereness and a somebodyness a somewhereness and a somebodyness. So the somewhereness, I like to think about, anybody familiar with the, the French word terroir? Have y'all heard this word? Um, it's uh, uh, the, the set of uh, environmental factors that come together. If you taste a wine or a chocolate, I know y'all are Baptist, so you don't do wine. Um, chocolate, coffee, can we go there? Can we go with the chocolate or the coffee? Okay, cool. I was gonna do a dance break to do today too, but I was told not to do that here the dance break. You should see Methodists try to do it. It's terrible. It is bad. People, walkers coming out of their wheelchairs. Um, but so a terroir, so let's say we, we taste a chocolate or a coffee uh, and it has a certain flavor, a taste. Like I can tell this coffee comes from this place. I was at Atlanta a couple of days ago and they had this local coffee shop and they had all the different coffees from like Ethiopia, this coffee, that. Then there was the Atlanta blend. And I was like, I want the Atlanta blend. I want to know what Atlanta tastes like, right? What's the terroir or the somewhereness of Atlanta? 
Well, every community, rural, urban, suburban, whatever, has a terroir. It has a somewhereness. It has a flavor and a rhythm. And so if we're going to communicate the gospel, it has to be in the terroir, the somewhereness of that place and that people. It's also got to have a somebodiness, the great prophet. Y'all know this guy now, right? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who would teach people these principles of somebodiness and, and not to ever let anybody take away your somebodiness. You're a somebody. Uh, and his mentor, Howard Thurman, who talked about once we know we're kind of beloved of God and we have a somebody and identity, uh, it'll sustain us through all kind of challenges of life. And so the gospel also has to have a somebodiness where everybody's a somebody, where people have dignity, uh, where, where people of all different kinds of, of, of coming from different backgrounds and histories can have a sense of uh, inclusion into this and they can be a somebody in this community. And it has to resonate with those somebodies, those particular somebodies in that particular context. So Jesus of Nazareth didn't just love people universally. He loved particular persons with particular names and particular challenges and particular um, uh, crazy folks like Peter, you know, trying to jump out of boats and sticking his foot in his mouth all the time and people who had uh, challenges and, and, and he, he loved particular persons with real names and real situations. And we as the church have to love particular people in particular places with particular names. We can't just love people uh, in general. Can I get an amen on that? So when we, when we love particular persons like Jesus did, that actually had universal implications, right? So through loving those particular people in that particular context, in that particular moment of history, he redeemed the whole universe. Can I get an amen? Right? So when we do that, there's something universal that flows from our particularity as we share and love on people in those particular communities. Um, so this is the last thing I'm going to share today, and, and hopefully this is a helpful little framework. But Philippians 2, the mind of Christ uh, passage. So the Bible tells us not only what to think about, like if anything is just and lovely and good and true, right? Think about that. Think about these things. But the Bible actually tells us how to think or gives us a process to think. And if you look at Philippians 2, it's a hymn really that probably many biblical scholars believe predates Paul. But it was one of the first things that Christians began to believe about Jesus. They began to actually probably sing this together. And Paul includes it in his letter in Philippians. And you can see there's an ascent and a, a descent and an ascent kind of trajectory that's happening there. Who Jesus, who being in the very form of God, did not grasp equality with God as something to be exploited. He empties himself, taking on the form of a slave, literally a doulos, being found in human likeness, being found in human form, becomes obedient to a human death, uh, even death on the cross. And therefore God also highly exalted him. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. You're supposed to say amen there, because this is good news. Um, so what if we took that, though, and we used it as kind of a framework to think about our communities? So Paul's saying, I want you to have the same mind in you that was in Christ, the mind of Christ. And then he lays out what that mind looks like, like in this series of movements, right? Right? Um, so what if we were to think about, here's a way maybe to think about our lives, our communities. And so it starts with this kind of self-emptying. The big seminary term there is kenosis, kenotic, self-emptying, kenuo, there's the Greek language there. So Jesus consciously empties himself. Incarnation is about putting on flesh, making his dwelling among us, uh, right? There's the cross, so um, Jesus goes to the cross for all the, the sins and brokenness of the world. There's some tomb time that happens there, some liminality, some in-betweenness. Then there's the resurrection, the ascension, and then the new creation. A new creation is created through Jesus' you know, trajectory and path and journey of incarnation. So let, let's think about it like this. What if this is a framework for us to think about our communities, to intentionally engage our communities for Jesus? Uh, and the first thing we need to do as a church is unlearn a lot. Okay? Unlearning. So I got two amens out there. Two people said amen. But unlearning, it's not forgetting. 
It is, it is a conscious choice to self-empty and to come in a, in a position of humility and say, maybe we actually don't understand our community. Maybe the way we've been doing church for people here is not actually working. Maybe we thought this about our community, but that might not be true anymore. Maybe it was true at one point, but we need to unlearn all of that so that we can start to see our community as it really is. Maybe it's some unlearning even about ourselves or about our congregation or about whatever, but there's that, that unlearning first, right? And so we could get together with a team of people in our church. We could say, what, what do we need to unlearn about our community? What do we think we know that might not be true? And then the next stage of it is incarnation or immersion. So let's do this, prayer walks. Let's literally walk around in our community together, maybe in little groups. Let's pray over our community. What do we see? Schools, churches, what's happening in our community? Where are people gathering? What third places are they hanging out in? And what if we actually immerse ourselves and commit to prayerfully just be in our community? Like say two or three of us, we're just gonna hang out at most Southwest Grill on Wednesdays and just connect with the people that work there and the people that are coming in and out or a coffee shop or a park or wherever that place is in your community, um, but go there and just kind of faithfully immerse ourselves in that. And then we're minding the gaps. So we're looking for um, where's the gaps in the fullness of God's kingdom uh, and what is in our community today. So where are there gaps in poverty or um, where are there gaps in uh, racism, where are there gaps in you know educational equality, whatever that is, where are there gaps in isolation where people are lonely and, and disconnected. Uh, and we're, so we're looking for those gaps, those cross things. Then we're gonna go through that disorientation. Uh, when we do this stuff, so who was the one who said, I pray that you fail? Was that spoken over you, Mike? I say amen to that, whoever had the wisdom to say that. It, yes, give it up, that's beautiful, yes. Because um, if we don't actually fail as we're doing this, we're probably not doing something Jesus called us to do. If we can just go do this by our own strength and our own ingenuity and our own ideas, it's probably just something we could do. We don't even need Jesus or the Holy Spirit to do it. Amen? We are going to fail as we, as we do this stuff, as we try to cultivate new Christian communities with people, as we engage our communities. If we're not failing, we're not doing something right. right? But that, that tomb time is where we hit the wall, and it's like, God, we need you to show up I like to call it the WTF moment. Don't ask me to unpack that in this space, but that's where we hit the wall, and God, if you don't show up right now and show us the way through this, uh, we're stuck without you, right? We need your Holy Spirit. We need your presence. We need your guidance. Think about what the disciples are doing when Jesus is executed, uh, and then what do they do? They're holed up in a little room with the windows barred and the doors locked. They're like, we got to get out of here. We're going to be next to get crucified, right? Or they're walking back to Emmaus because they're like, we thought Jesus was the guy. Apparently he wasn't. He died on the cross. Couldn't have been him, right? So there's this disorientation, this tomb time that's happening. And that, in that magic moment, in that tomb time, that's when the risen Jesus often shows up and breathes on us and shows us the wounds and says, receive my spirit. Now I'm sending you, just like the Father sent me, now I'm sending you out in a new way, right? And that then we get to that discovery piece, like, oh, Jesus was here all along, and he's moving in this thing, and this is the way he's kind of calling us, and it's metanoia. It's a shift in our mental models. It's a change in a way of thinking. We're awakened to some new reality, uh, the risenness of Jesus and how it's at work in this situation. And then there's the embodiment of something new. It could be a new church. It could be a new ministry. It could be a new person. But as we go through this journey, uh, we're going to create something. Something new is going to be embodied in this. Um, so that framework, does that, does that sound helpful for anybody as we're thinking about engaging our communities, uh, unlearning and kind of moving out and immersing ourselves? You can totally steal it. I'm going to send you the PowerPoints uh, so you can, you can use these um, if, if they're helpful for you, of course. Um, just to, to kind of flesh this out a little bit, let's look at the, the gaps piece of this, and then I want to show a little video, and then I'll just invite any questions that you have. But say we're, we're immersing ourselves in our community, we're looking for those gaps. 
uh, and that's usually where we're going to find Jesus. Like where the pain point is, where the struggle is, uh, that's where I usually say, oh, look, Jesus has been out here all along, you know, working in this space. So let's say that that's shame or self-worth or truth or poverty or wealth or you, you see all these things up on the, on the, uh, the, uh, the screen there. But those gaps between sickness and health, between illiteracy and education, between homelessness and refuge. You know who the people have been for the past 2,000 years that step into those gaps? The church, followers of Jesus, Christians, right? And when we do that, we get stuff like, guess what Christians created? Hospitals. St. Basil in the 300s AD created the first free hospitals. There were previously Roman hospitals for Roman people, but free hospitals for everybody. Christians did that, right? People are sick, they're suffering. Let's create a way to care for them, right? Universities and schools, guess who created those? Christians, right? And monasteries and getting together and creating centers of learning and helping people read scripture and be educated. Now, we, we missed the mark in some ways during time in history, right? Shelters. Christians created those. Like, we need to put people up and house them when they're experiencing homelessness, those kind of things. So you can see those gaps. Um, so we're going to watch a video here. Uh, and this is the Wildwood community that I was sharing about earlier with uh, racism and segregation and all those things happening. As we watch the video together, see if you can identify what the gaps were, what was created, and um, what, what's the things that are being healed. When I first came to the Wildwood area, it, you know, it was mainly the whites was on one side of the track, the blacks was on the other side of the track, <laughs> you know, and I've heard so many stories, you know, about racism, you know, in the Wildwood area. This church was planted 1881, Methodist Episcopal South, wrong side of the slavery issue. So this church has been a white congregation since 1881. And so we don't think that reflects God or his heart or his, his community or the new creation. So we've been trying to break that down. And in the midst of all that, this opportunity arose with Pastor Taylor and it created a whole new synergy in this church. So when I first came to it, it seemed that it was an outreach to anybody. It was people that was recovering drug addicts, people that's not even members of the church. It just was a community outreach. Come and let's dine together. First, it was a little tension, you know, because like I said, the community, the black and white, you know, the racial tension was there. You know, we just have to call it what it is. The racial tension was there. Our church was not comfortable walking through these doors for Taste of Grace. Now they would show up for the seven o'clock Bible study that we had, but not the Taste of Grace to sit down and eat. You know, so they are slowly <laughs> getting comfortable with showing up a little earlier. It's a God thing to bring, you know, the black community and the white community together and to actually fellowship together in the same space. He's bringing two cultures together. Age don't mean nothing. Race don't mean nothing. We are one. Because food is love. We're, we're becoming a family. No matter who it is, we're a family. I think this is a sign and a symbol of God's kingdom reign in the earth. And our community can look at this and go, okay, this is the way things have been for a long time, but it's a new day, and that's not going to be the way it is here anymore. We want this community to look like God's community, and I just think it's absolutely beautiful that Pastor Taylor can stand up on a Wednesday and say that you guys look like Jesus to us, because they look like Jesus to us. And so that is such a perfect mix. They just keep coming and keep seeing the love, you know, of a shared meal eventually they're hard to be turned towards God. Our children, they're getting a different kind of experience of the church from their youngest 
days of like, oh, look at this, you know, white folks, black folks gathering together, they all love Jesus, they feed each other, they care for each other, they pray for each other. You know, that's a significant formative thing, I think, for our children yeah. and for us and for our community. You know, God didn't just put us together just for us to s celebrate each other. You know, I think now it's time for us to go out into the community and say, come in, you know, there's a feast going on. So what did y'all notice? Uh, did you see any gaps? Did you see healing starting to take place? Racial divide, that's definitely there and real. Yep. Yes. Yep, there's a social and economic divide there as well. Yep. Yeah, 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 and that, that we could all come together, right? We're trying to combine our worship services and upsetting everybody, but we could all come together around that meal and that table. Um, and by the way, this is how Jesus planted the church, was around the supper tables, right? He ate good food with bad people. Um, he was criticized constantly because that's what he was doing all the time. He had terrible table manners. Um, they said, he's hanging out with unclean sinners and tax collectors, and why aren't your disciples doing the ritual cleansings and the thing like John's disciples are doing, right? He's just creating these messy table gatherings where everybody's welcome, and there he is in the midst of all that, right? Yeah. There's a feast going on, so the banquet language of salvation, right? That's one of Jesus' favorite metaphors about the salvation, the banquet, the party uh, that's happening in the kingdom. Sorry, somebody else was jumping in. Yeah, did you notice that the intergenerational is another gap that was kind of being healed through this, that kids middle-aged, older folks are all sitting together at the table. Yeah. So, go ahead. Yeah, you can fire away with questions, come on. <laughs> yeah, great question. I think we can pretty much move into questions, and Mike, throw something at me when I run out of time. And thank you, the afternoon after lunch session is always the funnest one. Can I get an amen? Because uh, <laughs> you're like, can I go take a nap? Some of y'all actually did take a nap during my, just kidding. Um, but yeah, so how do we disciple those people that, that they're coming just to have this community dinner and this meal? And, and please don't hear me saying all fresh expressions have to happen outside of a church campus. Especially in rural contexts, the church building is like the only third place in anywhere around. So we can really harness that. We're able to do our dinner church in our church building because we have a food pantry where hundreds of people come through. And so they're already coming to our church. So it's an easy next step for us. How many of you have a food pantry at your church? Okay, lots of folks in here have food pantries. So these people are already coming. They're already comfortable to do that. We have AA, NA meetings happening around the clock, so they're coming for those. So we're trying to make our church like a community space where it's not just to come and worship on Sunday morning, but you're free and welcome to come here all the time. So we house, we house an inpatient rehab in one of our churches at Wildwood. We house a, 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 actually a shelter for men experiencing homelessness at St. Mark's. So our church is being used by the community literally 24 hours a day all the time. So 
there's a different thing. Like some churches, probably a better idea for you to start your community dinner outside off your campus. It depends on the relationship that you have with the community. And that's where that contextual intelligence piece comes in, right? But back to your discipleship question. So these dinner churches are like really, really simple. Some of you are going, I'm not going to go start no church in a tattoo parlor or a dog park. But dinner church? So I just prepare a meal, and I get people from the community that don't go to church to come to a meal, and I share a Jesus story and a prayer, and now suddenly we're having church with the pe those people. So it's easy for us to just say, hey, food pantry folks, we like to not have to cook at dinner on Wednesday nights, too. Come and join us for this banquet festival, this meal. Um, and we put little cards on the table that say, hey, there's going to be a Jesus story during the meal. Um, if you want to stay for that, please do. But whether you stay or not, come back next week because we love you. So in the midst of the meal, we'll do the Jesus story. And here's the really long answer to your question about discipleship. So forgive me. But <clears throat> so the Jesus story, uh, we're, we're presenting the gospel. We're asking those questions. And then we're having table talk around that. So people are reflecting on Jesus, Christian, not Christian, everybody together. Um, people are getting their first exposure to like Christ and the gospel. And so there's like that incremental discipleship happening there. There's socialization that's taking place in discipleship. So people are learning how Christians relate and talk to each other and love each other. Um, so there's like these nonverbal cues. And as we live the aroma of Christ with people, that's having this transformative kind of thing. So that's discipleship. Um, we're also teaching people to pray for themselves and to study scripture. And then so as they're starting to come to community, I'm constantly looking out for people. I'm like, hey, did you, what did you think of the Jesus story this week? Wasn't that cool? Like, yeah, that was awesome. You want to do the Jesus story next week? Can you do the Jesus story? It's just five minutes. You tell the story and then you ask these questions. I'm like, I think I can do the Jesus story. Okay. Now they have to pick a Jesus story, right? They have to study it. They have to be able to communicate it, and they have to be able to say, why do I want this Jesus story? Why is this Jesus story compelling to me? And then they have to tell it. So immediately we're going from, I'm just a participant in this thing coming here, which we're really good at that in church, like creating pew potatoes, right? But this is like, oh, I got to actually bring, I got to do something here. I got to bring my own Jesus story. I got to lead in some way. And so that's a way of discipleship. And then we believe the Holy Spirit's moving in all of that on people's hearts as they're hearing the gospel, as they're hearing about Jesus, they're having to internalize it, they're having to share and then facilitate these conversations. So all of that's kind of discipleship that's happening. And then at some point they're usually going, hey, this is pretty cool. I think I'm going to start my own thing, whether that be in the, you know, wherever the dog park or the, the library or whatever. So they're growing to the place where they actually plant their own church. So that's a pretty significant step in discipleship. It's messy, it's not real programmatic or like, you know, here's the five bullet points and do it. But it's, it, it, it works, it's creating disciples. Did I answer your question at all? <laughs> now, sir, you're trying to trap me. Do y'all have, is there like a secret baptismal somewhere y'all are going to hold me down? And let's do, let's do this right, boy. You right? Um, yeah, we just use water and we pour, we sprinkle. We will fully immerse people if that's what they want. So we'll do anything. Uh, we're Methodist, so we like the splash zone, but. We will, we will dunk, we will dunk. Um, I, I got you. Let me, let me answer the, the harder part of that question that I think is really, really integral because this is where I think the shift in our mental model has to take place. And it's around the question of repentance and like a willy-nilly, loosey-goosey kind of community. So when you think about, we've done church for a long time in what, we, uh, what would be called bounded set evangelism. 
So there's like a clear boundary. You're in or you're out. You, you do the creed, you believe, you're in. There's behavioral expectations once you're in that kind of gated community and you, you, know, you have the gate code to kind of get in and then you behave. Um, these things are functioning in what we call a centered set evangelism model. So there's a clearly defined center. There's not really the clear gate or boundary around the community, but the center is defined. And we know that that center for us is the living person of Jesus. So we believe he's risen and he's in the community and he's the Lord of it. And we're just building space around him where there's people who aren't Christian, there are people who got really deep struggles in their life. There's people moving away from Jesus that are there. There's people moving toward him. We're just making that space in there. So we're flipping what you normally do is uh, believe, belong, behave, right? So I believe in Jesus then I get to belong to the community, and then I behave in a certain way to continue to be a part of the community. We're flipping that and creating belonging first, making space for Jesus to do his work. The Holy Spirit does the conviction, the transformation. People start to believe as they go along, and then their behavior is shaped on the tail end. Does that make sense? So in these communities, there are gonna be people who have really outside church behaviors. They're going to drop F-bombs. They're going to be drunk when they come. They're going to sometimes be smoking marijuana before they come, whatever. So, but but we're, it's, it's hard, and this is where, for those of us who are pastors, it's, it's, we, we, we have to do a little bit of this, and we just have to open it and trust that God's going to work in this if we put Jesus in the center and we know he's there. So conviction, repentance, all that stuff's happening, um, and one of the ways we get at it is through communion, the Lord's Supper and stuff. I know we have, you know, uh, different theologies around that, but we see that as a way for people to repent of their sin and take the meal. So we, we do it in a way where it's like, hey, we all do dumb stuff. We all break, you know, covenant. We do crazy things, but God loves us. And if you want to repent, we don't use those words, but if you want healing, if you want God's grace in your life, if you're struggling with something, you know, this is the place where you come to do that. And so that opportunity is there and it's repentance but we're kind of really trusting God to do that part. The part that, that I have to watch out for as the leader and the pastor and like the overseer of this is the harmful behavior stuff. So if someone's being harmful in the community, if someone's doing stuff that's not acceptable, that's hurting other people or themselves, then I have to step in as like the kind of the, the shepherd person and deal with that. But a lot of this is taking place one-on-one -on -one discipleship situations people coming to us after and saying, hey, I've really been struggling with this. Can you pray for me on this? And then we go deeper level of conversation. But yes, repentance, metanoia, transformation, all those things are happening. But it might not look like our conventional, we're going to have an altar call, everybody's going to come down and do it that way. So does that clarify, make sense? Okay, cool. Thank you. Great question. And don't feel free to ask me hard questions. Like, I, I if, you, if you're struggling with something, right, let's talk it out. I get death threats all the time. So. <laughs> Any other questions? For sure. Thank you for that, and thank you for that validation and honesty. Um, and and I want to just say too that this is um, so we have shifted all the stuff I shared earlier about you know uh, post Christendom and a, a post Christian reality. So th there was a pre Christian reality once, right? And how did the apostles go about 
sharing the gospel and creating churches everywhere. And, and so what they did was exactly what we're doing. The primitive church used the Kerjima, so the stories about Jesus and his teachings and his life, and they presented those to people. And then people repented and they accepted the story. And they were like, Jesus is Lord, right? And so that was the key thing. We, we were able to get away from that for a long time where we could build the buildings and people would come. And as a pastor, I have to now, I have a flock to care for with a bunch of people that are coming. Um, but, but most, the, the really hard thing, and I'm, I'm preaching to my own choir here, I'm a seminary professor, but we're not really preparing people for this reality that come out of seminary. Um, where for one, they're assuming they're gonna go to churches where there's people, amen? <laughs> like that's a pretty big problem because you have to be a missionary today as a pastor. You can't just be a pastor. You have, this is a mission field. I'm so uh, supportive and I love missionaries that we send and their work that they do. Um, but we also are in a missionary situation. This is the third largest mission field in the world in the United States, amen? amen? When we walk out that door, we're in the third largest mission field in the world, right here. So as pastors, we can no longer just think of just as shepherding the group we have, but really equipping, empowering, and unleashing them. And that is a hard, it's a stretch. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, sir. Yes, ma'am, and then come to you in the front. Exactly. Come on, come on, preach. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. And before I come down, let me just celebrate you for, for bringing the truth to us today. And thank you for your service as a missionary. And we are totally trying to learn from you and missionaries across history. And that's actually literally where all this comes from, because we are in a mission. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And just so I know pastors, this is not um, like, this is, this is challenging. It's not asking us to do anything more though. It's not saying, hey, add this to your plate in addition to preaching dynamic sermons, leading leadership meetings, uh, PowerPoint preparers, uh, mechanics, uh, janitors, uh, food preparers, uh, hospital visits. Can I say anything else, pastors? Right, there's a lot more, but all of that. So we're not saying now do this too. Right? We're saying empower the whole people of God and equip and unleash them to do this. Uh, and it actually makes my workload a lot lesser. Like my wife and I are both 10 hour a week pastors. We are part-time bivocational pastors. So our congregations get 10 hours a week of us. So everything that's happening here, it's all lay people that are owning the ministry, being missionaries, now owning the work and so they share in the preaching team they share in the care shepherding team that we do everything together as a priesthood of all believers in the long run it's harder up front 
but in the long run, you actually have uh, less that you have to do. It's more about equipping, encouraging, empowering people, and then you're serving as kind of the facilitator and cheerleader of that. So let me come to you, and then I saw your hand, ma'am. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I don't want to paint it like it's a, just a rosy little situation, okay? The inherited congregation was pretty toxic, um, just to be honest. And they were, they were a clergy killer. They had three pastors in three years. Actually, four pastors in three years. One pastor got like a six months and, and left. Um, so it was not like a healthy situation. And that's, so don't paint what I'm about to say like all congregations. Believe it or not, there are healthy congregations and they love God and they're good people. For some reason, my wife and I don't go to those congregations. Um, we're, we're like triage unit pastors. We're like emergency room. This church is about to die. That's our jam. We pray for that. We pray, God, send us to the churches no one else wants or sees. That's literally our prayer. Because we would, if we were like a big, fancy and healthy church, we'd probably mess it up. Um, so the, there, there's a lot of struggles, and the way that I can, the only way I can describe it, it's a tension to be managed, where I have to care for these people and love them and pastor them, because that's who I am, and that's my role as their shepherd. But I can't let that be my whole job. I have to also do these things in the community and set boundaries with them. So in the beginning, since you asked, I took the door off the office hinges of my office, and I stuck it in the sanctuary, and I preached a sermon series called The Open Door Policy. And I said, hey, it's great that you've had pastors that hang out in the office a lot during the week. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be out in the community. I'm going to come into your homes. I want to hear your story. I want to pray with you. I want to know who you are. But I'm going to also, part of my work as your pastor is going to be out in the community connecting with people. Because, by the way, things aren't going so hot here. We've been in decline for about 40 years, so this is where we're on the closure list. But because they had the gift of desperation, which in recovery community, that's our acronym, G-O-D, the gift, they were like, okay, well, we understand, we gotta do some things different. Now, if a congregation doesn't have that gift of desperation, it's really, really hard. Like, and some don't. And I, I have served some of those, and I was there for one year, and they're like, get this guy out of here, you know? But so over time, I think the culture has changed, and, and the people have embraced, um, change at the rate that they can stand it and sharing the stories of life change and then helping them feel connected to that and not leaving them in the rear view but helping them understand that they're they're fueling and unleashing this thing um, so that's what we try to do I had a question over here and then you sir yes amen <laughs> amen 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 that was God. i think you're going to close us down with the last question here because we got to go the um key thing that i love what you said about the holy spirit initiating and leading and like peter even after he denied jesus and got the three-time reinstatement and feed my lambs and all that 
you're right. Later in Acts, he's defaulted back to like a, a, a really kind of fundamentalist or like rule-based kind of thing. And Paul's like, what are you doing, man? This isn't what Jesus taught us, right? And he has to get called out on it. So the story is like the church failing forward in God and the Holy Spirit initiating new things with new people outside the current community, always moving out to the edge. So it's not that Peter has a bright idea and let me go get Cornelius. He didn't want to do it. The Holy Spirit was like, you're going to go to Cornelius, and, and then the Holy Spirit's poured out. It's the Spirit leading and initiating the mission. And we usually think it's us, and we're doing it. So I think it, this whole unlearning and sensing and try to find what the Holy Spirit's doing, that's the key to it all, what you just named, and then join into that. Sir, last question of the day. I know we got to go. Mike's giving me the signal. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, Mike. Thank you, everybody, for letting me be here. Hey, connect with me on social media. Uh, I have a website, michaeladambeck.com. If I, we can help you in any way, reach out to Mike. If you need resources or any further help with doing this stuff, I'd love to be a part of that. Yeah, Dana, is the, is the baptism full? Oh, gosh, here we go. I'm <laughs> Love Thank you too, you, sir. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.